On the AP Calculus BC exam, Unit 8 has several different applications of integration. You might want to pause the video and just read these bullet points for a few moments. In the following question, we will be looking at the second to last bullet point mostly. We're going to be reviewing how to determine volume using cross sections as well as the disk method. In other videos, we may encounter the washer method. So here is a question that's going to allow us to review some of these topics. It comes from the 2022 free response question from the AP Calculus BC exam. Please pause the video, read this problem over to yourself before listening on. This is a non-calculator question, so keep that in mind as you begin to think about how to solve it. Now after reading the question, we can look at part A, which asks us to find the area of region R. Now, of course, region R is illustrated in figure one, and we're simply finding an area. Now, we can find area, of course, by integrating across the bounds from one to five. We can see that region R is bounded from one to five, and then we have the function y is equal to one over x. So part A is a bit of a softball. We can find the area of region R by integrating from a lower bound of one to an upper bound of five of our function one over x dx. Now that's one of our sort of elementary functions. We don't need any special integrating techniques. We probably all know by now that the integral of one over x is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x. And then we're going to plug in our bounds. Of course, we plug in the upper bound first followed by the lower bound. We then find the difference between those two results the absolute value of 5 is 5, so we have the natural log of positive 5 minus the natural log of positive 1, which is actually 0. So the final answer to part A of the question is simply the natural log of 5. So that would represent the area of region R. Let's take a look next at part B. Part B says that region R is the base of a solid. For the solid at each x, the cross-section perpendicular to the x-axis is a rectangle with an area given by this expression right here. And then we're going to have to find the volume of this entire solid. So in order to help us understand this question, we're going to need to draw a representative rectangle. And in fact, that rectangle is in going to be a rectangular prism. It's going to have some thickness in order for us to be able to find a volume. A rectangle itself isn't volume, that would only be area we need actually a rectangular prism. So we're gonna draw such a prism. So there is the prism and we are told that the area of this prism is represented by x times e to the x over five. Now, because that's area, the area of a rectangle we all know is equal to the length times the width. So they're telling us that the area is equal to x multiplied by e to the x divided by 5. So if we line things up accordingly, we can see that the length of the rectangle would be represented as x, and then the width of the rectangle is represented by e to the x over 5. We can label those sides in the diagram. So the length could be this dimension right here. Again, that is x. And then the width would be this dimension. If I can find my highlighter right here, would be the width of the rectangle, that's e to the x divided by five. And then, because it's a rectangular prism, there's some thickness to it. Now, take a look at the thickness, and you'll notice that the thickness runs in a horizontal direction. So the thickness there, the thickness there, and the thickness there. That's a horizontal direction, in other words, it's the x direction. But it's a very tiny thickness. And in calculus, when you have a very tiny thickness or a very tiny length, you use a differential notation. So putting all these ideas together, the thickness of this rectangular prism would actually be dx. And you would ask yourself, well, how would I find the volume of that rectangular prism? We know that the volume of a rectangular prism is equal to the length times the width times the height. In this case, we're going to call the height the thickness, but it would be the same principle. So we take our length of x, our width of e to the x divided by 5, and then the thickness is dx. That would be the volume of that single rectangular prism. But we're not trying to find the volume of that singular rectangular prism. We're trying to find the volume of an entire region made up of several, in fact, an infinite number of those rectangular regions. We can't draw an infinite number of them, of course, but you can imagine that there would be another one that would be drawn in this vicinity right here. Might look something like that. Again, it's got some thickness. 
and we could draw a bunch of them. But the idea is to find the volume of an infinite number of them from one to five. Well, to do an uh, infinite number or an infinite summation, we have to integrate. So we would say that the volume would equal the integral and our bounds are still from one to five because we're using region R. And then we're going to use the volume expression of that rectangular prism that we developed earlier. Now, instead of saying X divided by five, I'm just gonna write that as one fifth X. That's an equivalent notation. So this is the problem that we are faced with. This integral is much more complicated than the one from part A, of course. We have the product of two functions. We could think about maybe using a U substitution, but in fact, integration by parts is going to be the most effective technique right here. So to integrate by parts, we're going to let u equal the x function, and we will let dv equal the other portion of our integral, so the e to the 1 5th x dx. And if you're wondering how do you know what to set u equal during integration by parts, you always set u equal to the function whose derivative becomes simpler. So for example, we have two functions. We have x and we have e to the 1 5th x. If we take the derivative of x, we would get one. If we take the derivative of e to the 1 5th x, well, we would get something more complicated. It would be 1 5th e to the 1 5th x. So again, when you're deciding what to let u equal, let u equal the function whose derivative becomes a simpler function. So in this case, we let u equal x. The derivative of x as noted is one. So we could say du dx is equal to 1, but if we multiply both sides of that by dx, we would have du is equal to dx. On the other side of integration by parts, you want to integrate. So imagine integrating dv, and if you do so, you would get v, and then we're going to integrate the e to the 1 5th x dx. Now, there's a bit of a shortcut. We'll take an aside and talk about that. Whenever you integrate e to a constant x, with respect to x. You could use a u substitution to integrate that, but you can also commit to memory the following shortcut. That is going to equal one over k e to the kx. So in this instance, the value of k is this coefficient of x, one fifth. So to integrate this, we would have one over that coefficient, so one fifth, and then we would have e to the one fifth x. Now, of course, one divided by one fifth is just five, so we can write that in a more simplified manner. So we'll clean up our workspace, and now we'll remind ourselves of the formula for integration by parts. So there is the formula, and we're just going to plug those components in. So the integral will be our u multiplied by v, so that's five e to the one fifth x, and then minus the integral of v again, so five e to the one fifth x, times du, which we can see is actually equal to dx. Now we can pull this five outside of the integral. And then we have a similar integration. We have the integral of e to the 1 5th x dx. Again, use that shortcut. So that would end up being one over 1 5th, which is just five, and then e to the 1 5th x. And then this is still multiplied by that five. Over here, we might wanna write this as five x e to the 1 5th x. Now we have a 5 times 5, so we'll just make that a 25. And now we are ready to plug in our bounds. Again, we are using region R to calculate this volume. So those bounds are going to be from 1 to 5. So this looks like it's going to be fun. Let's go ahead and plug in the 5 first, followed by the 1, and then find the difference. Now we will clean things up a bit here. 1 5th times 5, both of those right there are going to equal 1s, and then 1 5th times 1 will be 1 5th. In addition, we have 5 times 5, that'll make 25, and 5 times 1 will be 5. The 25e minus 25e will cancel out inside the brackets here. We can subtract those like terms to make negative 20e to the 1 5th, and then the double negatives make positive. So here we have the final answer to part B. This is the volume of that region explained in the question. So now it's time for part C which asks us to find the volume of the solid generated when the unbounded region W is revolved about the x-axis. So we're going to imagine taking region W and we're going to revolve it around the x-axis. So we're going to spin it this way. And in order to visualize that region, what we can do is actually reflect region W over the x-axis. So let's draw that. 
So there it is reflected, and when we spin the region W around the x-axis, we're going to get this three-dimensional shape. It's sort of like a cone or a lampshade, I guess, but it's an infinitely long lampshade, which is sort of interesting to find the volume of an infinitely large object. We would think that the answer is simply infinity, but not always. We'll find that the answer here is a finite outcome. And to, again, visualize what we're up to, we can actually draw a disk. So we're going to actually zoom in on this region just a little bit, and we're going to draw a representative disk. Now this disk will be oriented so that its thickness is parallel to the x-axis. So it sort of looks like a hockey puck or just like a really squat cylinder. And what we need is an expression for the volume of that squat cylinder. Now the volume of a cylinder is equal to pi radius squared times the height. Now, you might have to tilt your head sideways, perhaps, in order to see this, but the radius of this disk, and I confess I did not draw this terribly well, the radius of the disk, in fact, I'm going to resketch it. That's a little bit more like it. We want to make sure that horizontal axis cuts through the center of the cylinder. Now, hopefully, you can see more clearly that this is the radius right here. Now, that measurement is y. It basically travels from the x-axis out to this point on the curve, we know that the distance from the x-axis to a point on a curve is the y-coordinate. So we could say that the radius is equal to y, and then we don't forget to square it. And then the height of this squat cylinder would actually be this dimension right here. That dimension runs horizontally, and it's also a very, very tiny dimension, a very tiny height. And remember from earlier that a very tiny height would be using differential notation, and since it's parallel to the x-axis, we would call that dx. So this is the expression for the volume of our cylinder, but we look at the given equation and we can see that y is equal to 1 over x squared. So we're going to be able to make a substitution here in which we replace the y with 1 over x squared. And again, don't forget to square that. Now we can certainly simplify this expression. We have volume is equal to pi, and then we square the fraction to get 1 over x to the fourth dx. Now, this is the volume of just that single cylinder, but just like before, we're actually adding an infinite number of these three-dimensional objects. So if we're going to add an infinite number of them, we're going to have to integrate. So we could say that the volume of this infinitely large lampshade region is going to be the integral of our current expression, pi times 1 over x to the fourth dx. Now, the bounds are interesting as well, because if you look at the region w, the lower bound is 3, but then the upper bound is infinity. So we're ending up setting up an improper integral in which one of the bounds is either infinity or in some cases negative infinity. So this is the task at hand is to evaluate this improper integral and to do that we can use some formalized notation. We're going to replace the infinity with a constant. Sometimes we can use b, that's very common. And we're also going to factor out the pi just to set this up nicely. And then the 1 over x to the fourth can be written as x to the negative 4 dx. And then since we're replacing infinity with b, we're going to have to take the limit as b approaches infinity in order to maintain the original integral. So we'll clean that up right there. This is the integral we're trying to evaluate. It's a relatively benign integral to evaluate because we have x to the negative 4, so that's just a power rule. We add 1 to the power to make x to the negative 3 and then divide by that new power. So that would be negative 3. And then our bounds here are going to be from 3 to b. Now before we plug the bounds in, let's just rewrite our fraction inside that brackets just a little bit more neatly. We can actually write this as pi. The x to the negative 3 is going to go to the denominator to become x to the positive 3. We have a 3 in the denominator, and that negative sign you can leave down there, but I personally prefer to put it next to the little fraction bar right there. So here we are with our expression. We're now going to plug in the bounds and find the difference. So we have plugged the bounds in, and the most interesting aspect here is this expression right here. We have b in the denominator, but b is growing without bound. It's approaching infinity. So we basically have pi divided by infinity, technically negative pi divided by infinity. But as we know, when we divide something infinitely, it shrinks and gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually that limit approaches zero. So we are left with zero. Subtracting a negative is addition, so it's plus pi 
And then in the denominator, we can cube the 3, which is 27, and then multiply by 3, which is 81. So we can see that the final answer after simplifying is pi over 81. That is the volume of that infinitely large lampshade region. So this question involved a little bit of a lot of things, but it was mainly a question devoted to unit 8 of the BC Calculus curriculum, which again is finding volumes using cross-sections, which is what we did in Part B, and then the DISC method, which is actually what we did in Part C. So there'll be more com uh, videos coming from Unit 8, so stay tuned. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this and found it useful.